Welcome to another episode of the Everyday Expertise Podcast. I'm your host, Roland Martin, and I hope that today's conversation will expand your knowledge. Today I welcome Chet Martin to the show. Chet is a horseman and trainer who also enjoys competing and showing horses in several disciplines. I know very little about the horse industry, and Chet did well at educating me on his job, as well as the specifics of the different types of competition in which he participates. His love of horses and passion for his job comes through in this conversation, and I really enjoyed interviewing him. I hope that you will enjoy it and learn from his expertise. Welcome, Chet, to Everyday Expertise. I'm really excited to have you here. Thank you. It's awesome to be here. I'm excited. To, uh, I'm excited about this. Good. Yeah, that's great. Um, just before uh, we get into our topic for today, I just uh, wanted to thank you for the um, note that you sent me. Like I think it was a couple days after the I came out with the first episode, and um, you just uh, sent me a note saying, "Hey, it's." Great to see you're doing a podcast and um, and really enjoyed it and um, yeah just encouragement like that really is is a helpful thing so just uh, wanted to thank you for that and thank you for for coming on uh, the show today. No, that's awesome. No, I I'm a huge uh, podcast fan. I love I love podcasts. I listen to all kinds of podcasts and I've always thought that it's a great idea to get like everyday normal people on and uh because it's so cool to to hear um well anytime you go to a family gathering or whatever yeah and you yeah. hang out with people um it's it's always fun to hear what makes them tick or what what are they excited about or what are the yeah what what gets them excited and yeah. uh and so to do it in a podcast uh format is is awesome because then you can just hear so many more of those conversations. So I, I think it's great what you're doing here with everyday expertise. The name is perfect. It fits, yeah. <laughs> fits the, fits the agenda really well. Yeah. Well, that's great. And yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, learning from your everyday expertise as well. So yeah, start. What's, uh, what's your work like? What keeps you busy these days? <clears throat> well, for the most part right now, basically, um, riding horses, um, training horses day in and day out pretty much from, before the sun comes up to uh, <laughs> after it goes down most days um um that keeps us pretty busy and then between that and also coaching coaching some people okay, as well yeah. and um and then also competing uh, we're in the middle of our um competition schedule right now with okay. the horses so that that keeps us really busy this time of year okay gotcha so your 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 job your life is horses is that is that how you describe it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. uh it's more than not just a job, I guess. It's a it's a lifestyle. Yeah. Pretty much. If you're going to make a living in the horse industry, it's got to be you've got to be committed to the the horse lifestyle because it's 24 24 7 type of yeah. uh, job and the horses don't care what day of the week it is or what <laughs> time it is. So Yeah, I got you. So is it are you do you have your own horses? Is that all the ones you're working with or how does how does that I yeah, have a few, um, but no, very, okay. um, I, I can't afford horses. Okay. No, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, no, uh, for the most part, I'm, I'm training, um, clients horses. Okay. Yeah. Got you. Yep. So they'll send a horse to you for a period of time or C correct. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, most of the time, um, people are like, they'll send me a horse for whatever amount of time it, it takes. So, and it, it really depends on the on what the goal is for that horse. So okay. sometimes, you know, people will send a horse for a, a couple week tune up or a month tune up. Oh, okay. And then sometimes we'll have a horse for four years, depending on, um, or longer, just that kind of depends okay. on, depends on what the goal is for that horse. So, well, some of these horses have had training previously yep. before they get yep. to you. Okay. Yeah. Some of them do. Some of them have been with other trainers. Some of them, maybe people trained themselves up to a certain point right. and then right. ran into ran into some trouble. Um, some of them and all types of horses, like some of them are family horses that are just going to be used for, um, like a backyard type oh, of yeah. horse. And so like they maybe run into a little problem, they have a little trouble with the horse. So we'll try and help them. And then some of them are, um, competition horses of all okay. types. Um, and, uh, some of them are already competing maybe. And they, and they're just, um, maybe switching, 
trainers going to trying a different program mm -hmm. or whatever. So a little bit of everything. Got you. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you do in a day or what does a typical day look mm -hmm. like? Um, well, usually first thing, um, I, I feed, I get up first thing in the morning and I feed, feed, uh, hay to everything to the, the whole barn. And then, uh, and then I pretty much will go from that in the summer when it's hot, I try to work, um, some of the, uh, the more high performance horses. I try to work first thing while like, oh, yeah. like while it's still cooler out. Like makes maybe, sense. I like to run in the cool um, of the day as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So like in the summer when it's hot, you know, we try to try to get going like four, okay. well, four, yep. four or five o'clock in the morning for sure. And, um, and, uh, try and get, uh, get to some of those more high performance horses. Um, and, uh, and usually often I, so I also work several different disciplines of horses and one of them is cow horses. And, uh, and so I'll try to work my cow horses in the morning because those, that also involves another animal, which is cattle or okay. we also use buffalo as well. But, um, so I try to work those early in the morning while it's still cool because a cat, um, the cattle don't really feel like moving very much once it's oh, yeah. 35 degrees in the middle of the right. day and humid yep. or whatever there so so yeah that's usually the first thing that i start with in the summer when it's hot this time of year um i kind of finish up my the rest of my chores any uh um any other little stuff that i want to get done before i get to riding mm -hmm. um i kind of do that first thing and then uh and then as soon as i'm i'm done those other little errands and then i pretty much go to uh get to riding um yeah, pretty much get to get to my list of horses. I okay. kind of make yep. a list at the start of the day, which ones I want to work on. And then I, I kind of, um, schedule those based on what I'm trying to accomplish that day. Mm -hmm. So maybe if I'm, and it, a lot of it was really, um, dependent on, um, the ground as well. So like first thing in the morning there, the arena isn't quite as busy. So I might try and, uh, and, um, use the fresh dirt and what we mean by fresh dirt is like we groom the arena groom the sand every day okay um sometimes a couple times a day but uh i try to use that fresh dirt on the horses that are going to be doing the most impact the most high in impact oh, maneuvers yeah. mm -hmm. um so i try to use that fresh dirt on those more high performance maneuvers mm -hmm. with the horses and so so yeah that's usually kind of the first ones that i work and then from there it just depends on who's coming that day for coaching or, oh, yeah. or, um, what customers want to come to maybe see a horse, see a horse perform to, to okay, yeah. possibly buy or whatever. So. Yeah. So when you're talking about coaching, does that mean that you're training a person to, to Correct. work with a horse? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So they, people will, um, maybe bring their own horse, um, and, and have a lesson on it or, uh, um, okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, like show me what they're, having trouble with or maybe we just want to keep trying to improve what we have been working on or yep. um and then and we also have a few lesson horses at the barn where oh okay um so yeah where if people want to come uh, so i could come get a lesson even if i don't own my own horse yep okay yep yep, yep. yeah usually um i have uh i have some assistants that also ride as well okay and uh so usually the the uh the more beginner lessons um um one of my assistants will will uh take take those people and then mm -hmm. if they once they kind of get past a certain point and 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 they're serious about competing or whatever then i kind of take them on from that point oh, okay. or, yep. or or my one of my assistants will if it seems to be working if the the fit seems to be working well or we just kind of try to mix and match the personalities of, between the horses and the people okay. and yeah. <laughs> try to make something work yep yeah very good anything else that's uh, significant from a typical day uh and yeah, not really. It's pretty much, uh, it's yeah. Every, every day is very like every day is different. There's no, it's yeah. not, yeah. It's not like every day is, uh, this is my exact routine every, every day. Yeah. It's, uh, they, the sense, days yeah. vary a lot with, yeah. just based on the horses and everything. And so you have your own business that you're doing this is, is yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's called uh, Martin ranch. Okay. Um, pretty <laughs> unoriginal <laughs> um, but uh yeah we're just up uh above our right just outside of arthur on highway six there okay um so, so do you live right there on your on yeah your farm? we live yep. live on the farm on the ranch yeah. Is that on the ranch yeah, yeah. it's Very only nice. 50 acres so it's a small okay. ranch but uh <laughs> yep. but it's still a ranch <laughs> yeah and um you said you do have some animals besides horses um what's what uh what all kinds of animals do you have 
Yeah, we just uh, we well we have a few dogs and uh, and then we we keep some cattle there, um, mainly just for for training the horses with. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And then we also have a few buffalo. Um, we try to try to keep a few buffalo around there all the time because they they stay a lot fresher to work the horses. Oh, okay, with, so. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, you said that that horses are kind of a lifestyle. So I don't know if you have um, time for hobbies or interests outside of uh, outside of that. But do you have any that uh, that you'd like to share just to say a little bit more about, about who you are? I had seen that to question <laughs> there um, if I have any hobbies. And I was trying to think about that. And I'm, I'm like, man, I, I there's so many things I would love to get into yeah. and I would be excited to do. Um, I I can't even list them all. There's, I would love to, I, I would just love to try everything. I, I, I think rock climbing looks like fun. I used to do, um, quite a bit of biking when I was younger. Oh, neat. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, basically the last 10 years have been, uh, have been, I haven't had time to really do any of that stuff. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I enjoy outdoor things. Like I, um, my wife and I enjoy hiking mm-hmm. and, and things like that so uh yeah we we enjoy that that so any outdoor activity like that mm-hmm. um we we really enjoy but as far as something that i'm really passionate about uh, and and actually make the time to do um um <clears throat> yeah and i enjoy roping but uh that and that's kind of i consider that to be a hobby but it's still kind of horse related so okay uh, so I guess uh, I don't know if that counts or not. What do you mean by roping, or what what are you doing? Uh, oh, just roping cattle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just uh, yeah, um, whether it's ranch roping, like to whether it's cattle that need to be doctored or whatever. Okay. And yep. Kind of just have fun doing that, or 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 a bit of team roping for fun. We have roping shoots set up there. Okay. Um, at home and in the winter during our slow time, we do more of that. Oh, so neat. that's kind yeah. of our. I I find that super relaxing because I don't feel like I have to. Uh, I don't feel like I have to be as focused on my horse's performance. I can okay. just kind of go out there and ride and have fun and, and do and yeah. do a little roping, um, kind of like uh, you might shoot a basketball, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah, that's great. Um, so when you were talking there about um, that a significant amount of your time or most of your, your time and energy is, is gone into um, your work there, your work with horses. So is that something that a passion that you've always had, a love that always had, or where, where did that come from? Um, where it came from? I, I don't know. I think it's kind of, <laughs> it's, I think it's kind of something you might be born with. Um, okay. mm-hmm. it's, I don't know. Yeah. As far as long as I can remember, I've always, I, I've always loved horses. I guess I've always loved animals. Um, I, I don't know that I, like horses were definitely always my, my favorite animal, but, uh, I, I just, I've always loved animals and, and always wanted to work with animals. Nice, yeah. Um, and I, and I always wanted to, my, my dream would have been to always work with horses. I didn't, okay. I didn't know if it was going to be possible um, right, to yeah. do it full time, but that was always definitely my, would have definitely been a goal or a dream of mine. If, okay. If, yeah, for sure. Did you grow up with them? Like- yeah, we had horses growing up. Um, I think I got my first pony when I was maybe five years old or something my okay. dad and enjoys horses and yeah always had some so yeah we always had some horses around there um yeah we had that got my first pony there and that that quickly turned into another one and then uh pretty soon we yeah I think growing up we always had like uh between half a dozen or a dozen horses around there okay. some kind my dad would go to the sale barns and and we would pick up uh just kind of some random horses and and uh, often, often mares that were about to have foals, and then we would fold them out, and then, and then my job would be to try and retrain the mares, and then we would sell them, and then okay. once yep. the foals were old enough, we would kind of try to get them started, and then sell those, and so that was kind of yeah. Growing up, that was kind of a um, there was o- there was always plenty of horses around okay, to ride, yep. anyways. So did you did your dad teach you t- how to train horses, how to work with them, or did you um, learn it on your own, or? Uh, that's a good question. I, yeah, I definitely learned some things from my dad, um, early on, um, growing up with, yeah, just growing up around horses, animal (laughs) husbandry, looking after horses and and animals and all that sort of thing for sure. Yeah, definitely learned, uh, some of those things from my, from my dad. And then, um, I quickly, like really early on, I was super into trying to see what I could teach them to do. Um, okay. Like, um, yeah, very early on, I don't know, probably already at, um, 
between eight and 10 years old, I was already trying to read any sort of training information oh, I could yeah. find in a magazine or, or a horse book yep. of some kind. I would try to, I think if there's a, if there's a training method out there, I've probably tried it. Um, okay. I pretty much any, any new fangled idea that I read in a magazine, I would be all over it and wow, yeah. trying it out. And yeah, so. So it's been something that you've constantly been teaching yourself and and learning yeah for sure and i have had a ton of help along the way like definitely still to this day very a ton of help along the way but uh, but very 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 early on um for sure um yeah it it was just always uh yeah i think my dad would get pretty annoyed with me sometimes because we'd be we used the horses to we had cattle at home there as well and we used the horses for um you know to doctor cattle and to move cattle from one pasture to the Mm -hmm. next and that sort of thing and and uh anytime we were going out to actually try to do an an actual job um i was always off over in the corner trotting circles trying to get teach my horse some little trick or whatever and we had a job to do so i'd get i'd kind of had to keep getting reminded hey look we still got to move these cattle here and it doesn't matter how pretty your horse trots around in a circle there we got to get a job done so. <laughs> yeah so yeah no, that, that's that's fascinating that um yeah just how how you something you worked on and obviously something that you've always um found fascinating and interesting enough to to uh keep working on and doing so yeah that's great was there um is there anything that's like really stands out as really pushing along your knowledge and experience or is it just something that's incrementally built i I think yeah it's definitely just been a one foot in front of the other sort of thing that's grown really slowly really young i think i was maybe 11 years old and my dad took me to a a colt starting clinic um, okay um where i yeah to to learn how to how to start colts and it, it was very very basic um basic information and it wasn't anything like looking back now it, it was it was nothing that um not that big of an event it was just a local local horseman that mm-hmm. had put on a clinic there but um and but he took me to that and that was the first time that I had had been in that sort of a teaching environment okay. and like and like learning from the horse sort of an environment and uh, and so I think um like from a but yeah when I was maybe around 11 years old he had kind of entered me into this um clinic and mm-hmm. uh and and i and the guy actually was putting it on was also our our blacksmith so our our farrier um and so he he shot our horses and stuff and and uh and so and he had kind of taken me under his wing really early on he had oh um, neat taught me how to you know shoe a horse and trim Mm -hmm. trim a horse's feet and stuff like that like really young like I I was I, I remember I I was way too I was very small for my age I actually still am, but um I was I was really small for my age and I remember trying to trim my pony's feet I was probably I was probably ten years old oh, wow. and, and my my knees would just be shaking and I'd be almost collapsing under the weight of this little pony and uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah so he's the guy that um, actually he kind of he had he had taught me a lot of little things early, okay. early on there, um, but along with so many other pe- mm-hmm. people, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, um, yeah, he, that, that was kind of, I would say that was kind of a, um, that my dad kind of showing me that confidence in me and like willing yeah. to kind of invest that, uh, like, cause I knew it cost money to enter me into this clinic and stuff yeah. and, and him kind of investing that, um, that confidence in me or, or whatever I, I, I remember that was like, that was a pretty big deal yeah, for me at that, at that time. <laughs> and yeah, like, I mean, it's come up a little bit and just what you've been, mm. what you've been saying here, like how important a role mentors play in our, in our lives and in our, in our development. And um, yeah, I can tell that that's been quite significant in, in uh, getting you to this point as well. Um, yeah. When did you kind of recognize mm. or realize that this is something that you could do as a career? <sighs> Um, I'm not sure that I've even realized it. Yet. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, no, um, I don't know. I think, uh, well, I know that, um, as a late teenager, um, cause I always had, always had a couple horses in training for outside clients, like okay. very, from a very early age, like, um, 
whether it was neighbors bringing their ponies over that yeah they had i was gonna trouble ask with. like kind of word of mouth kind of things that would yeah get you yeah into the, yeah. yeah it was just people kind of knew that uh, i i liked horses and yep. so so i'd have buddies and stuff that hey we got a horse here that bucks us off or whatever mm-hmm. and can you get, can you do you want to climb on it or that sort of thing yeah and uh so that that was from a pretty early age i i and all through my teenage years i pretty much always had a project on the go like with on the side of a day job and Mm -hmm. and that and so i would kind of um yeah i would kind of um say that it was it was i never i guess i always thought um it's something i would like to do but i wasn't sure if how i would go about transitioning from having one or two project horses on the side of a day job how i would transition that into into a full-time gig so how did that happen um i I guess i just kind of kept i i just gradually had got a couple more horses in training and a couple more and and uh eventually at one point i kind of had to make a decision on whether i continue with my construction job and uh and kind of make that the priority and and just oh, okay. and just and just have a few on the side or whether um or whether I want to do it full time it was kind of um yeah kind of getting to the point where both uh, both things were were keeping me pretty busy so so I would oh, okay. I would work all day and then I would come home and uh and I would train horses with a headlamp at night oh, wow. <laughs> in the fields and yeah. uh, so that uh that that was uh so then there wasn't very much time to sleep anymore. <laughs> and so I kind of, um, I kind of, um, this, so that, and that by this time we were married and I, I remember, oh, okay. yep. yeah, I remember, uh, um, telling my wife, I was like, well, if I could just train horses full time and then that would leave my evenings open so that I could, uh, so that I would have, wouldn't have to work all the time. And, uh, that was, I don't know if, um, what gave me that a bright idea that that's actually how that would play out, but uh, <laughs> that hasn't happened or what? I don't know that it quite will look the way the way I, at the time in my head it all made sense, but uh, I'm not sure it quite uh, has always worked out into that much extra free time as, yeah. as what I thought. But so, did it feel like a a risky decision to to do horse training full time or? did it feel like i have so much i could could no, be working with here no it did it did feel like it at the time i was actually um um i was working for an overhead door installation division of another company and uh and i had a lot of opportunities there it was a young business that okay. kind of a side yeah. business that w- um was really growing and uh and it was uh and i really enjoyed it it's not that i didn't enjoy it mm-hmm. i i really did enjoy it and um and it was something that i i was excited about the future of the of the company and everything and uh and i had a lot of opportunities there so so yeah it did see it did feel like a big a big step to uh to step away from that okay. for sure yeah. at the time it was like but i kind of yeah i had a few a few key people that spoke into my life right over that time and i and I finally decided you if I even if I fail at this, I if I don't try it, then um then I'm always gonna wonder if I maybe could have uh, done yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. So So um so you made that decision and was it was it tough at the beginning to to make it work or did um, it did it fall into place pretty quickly? It, it was um a little bit, um, but it it was also one of those things, um we had very low overhead at the time. We right. Were, yeah. We were uh, we were just renting a, renting a place um, that had a small barn on it. Okay. Um, on a farm, um, just a yeah, just a farm near near Drayton there, and it just had an old barn and an old an old hay shed. There was not very much there, so it was pretty cheap to it was pretty cheap to live there. We didn't have a lot of a lot of extra overhead. And my wife was also working at the time, so she kind of carried us through right, yeah. there at the beginning a little bit. And I, um, right over that time, I actually went to work for another trainer as well. Oh, okay. Um, some of the time, just to help, kind of help me learn more as well. It was a, a trainer out near Campbellville, so it was a pretty long drive to do that. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, twice a day drive, drive out there and back, and uh, 
and uh so it was a it was a that was a little a little tricky to work that in it felt like i was spending a lot of time on the road um but i he was a he was into training um competition horses oh, okay. and so it was a kind of a way for me to kind of open that door a little bit learn a little bit more yeah. about the competition side of things because up until that point i had been mainly um mainly just working with um ranch horses and okay. um trail horses and just starting colts of various disciplines as mm -hmm. well um and ranch horses was my main interest i really enjoyed like teaching you know teaching horses to have a a good handle where they where they're very very responsive and mm -hmm. you can you know rope off them and just do okay just yep. do do general work off of a, off yep. of those horses and that was kind of my main interest i never really planned to get into the competition okay, side of things but yeah. i thought if i would work for a competition <clears throat> um trainer um loris epis was the guy's name and mm -hmm. he uh or is is still training out out that direction <clears throat> now and um and he's an I italian guy that actually moved over here um yeah he moved moved over here from from italy and oh, yeah. and uh became a pretty successful local trainer or very successful local trainer actually and uh and so yeah i just i worked with him for for a year and um and kind of just at that point it was just getting to be like there was just a lot of it was just a lot of driving a lot yeah. of time on the road and and um so i I eventually, and even all during that time, I was still training some, I had some of my own okay. clients and I was training, training my own horses or clients of my own. I had horses for my own clients as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, all during that time. And so, uh, so yeah, so, so I, I basically did that for the experience, um, mm -hmm. just to try and try and learn more. And, and then, uh, so that was one of the guys that kind of got me started in the, in the, um, yeah, kind of got me started in in the uh, Compet the competition horses. Were you competing on like yourself at that before that or not? Um, no, no, okay. I wasn't yep. competing at that point. I was, yeah, like I said, just mainly starting colts and stuff like yep. that. And then and then I did uh, I did show one horse for one of his clients while I was working for him. Um, and then um, at the end of that show season, um, I I quit working for him and went. Uh, full time on my own and I didn't have very many horses at that point but um but I and I didn't really know if I would compete after that I wasn't I just thought at that point I had enough outside clients that I I could make a go of it just starting colts and okay. I, I wasn't yeah. sure how I'd get through the winter because at the end of show season there was like around Christmas time and so I thought well if I can just make it to spring then I should be okay because the spring spring usually gets busy with okay. yep. with colts to start and stuff and so I I did start a few colts um th over the winter there and uh, and gave some lessons and did some freelance work where I would drive to people's places and work with their horse oh, yeah. wherever they had it and stuff like that and yeah I did a, I was doing some horseshoeing at the time as well I do okay. a little bit of farrier work and uh, a little bit of hoof trimming for yeah just a just a bit of general farrier work and. Uh -huh. kind of did whatever it took and then um then that spring it did get it did get really busy okay and i actually was very fortunate i had a couple um of clients that gave me the opportunity to compete with a few of their horses oh, and uh and they weren't high level horses or anything but they gave me the opportunity they would pay for my entry fees and oh wow and, okay and yeah. you know give me a chance to get out there and and compete a little bit and so and that was just at a local level mm -hmm. that first year and it wasn't uh that big of a deal but uh but it was i it was really neat that these people were giving me that chance yeah to do that and um and so i uh yeah just uh that first year i showed a couple horses for some clients at some local shows and then at the end of that year then i had a guy um call me about showing his horse and it was a it was a, a little higher caliber horse oh, okay. um and so i was able to kind of kind of from there I started traveling out a little bit further to some bigger competitions and and um so the the first couple of years there our our industry has um in the reigning horse industry we we'll, can we can get more into the different yeah. disciplines later but there's different levels there's like rookie professional is the is the the lowest level okay. of, of yep. professional competition and then there's limited intermediate and open 
um, the different levels like that. And so the first couple of years I was, I was in those, in the lower levels there. And then that second year, um, that horse, that horse that I, that I got to show that second year, um, he was a really good horse and okay. he just, uh, he just kind of babysat me. He made me look <laughs> way better than what I was. And, and, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, so we would, we traveled around and, and, and basically cleaned up like those lower levels and okay. that, but that bumped me out of all the, all three lower levels in the first year or oh, in wow. the second year of my competition. So the third year, then I got a bit of an eye opener because now I was out of those lower divisions okay. and it was a lot tougher to. So, uh, so you weren't allowed to like they when you said it bumps you up that like the if you win enough they send you up to the next level or what? Correct. Yeah, okay. it's based on earnings. So like okay. the, however much you've earned. So our industry um, is based on. So some industries are based on in the horse show world are based on points. So like you get a certain amount of points and then okay. you're bumped out of different divisions. Our industry is it's money, it's dollars earned. Okay. And so there's just the levels are all based on dollars that you have earned. Gotcha. Whether they some of them are are an average spread over a couple of years. So however many dollars mm -hmm. you've earned over these amount of years that's the division that you fall into okay. yep. um and it's not that it's big dollars it's not like the racehorse industry where it's like where you're talking millions of, do of okay, dollars yeah. of end of prize money and stuff like that like it's it's much it's the dollars don't really earn don't really um don't really make up for the dollars that the owners have spent to okay. get that horse there yeah but um where it matters is each horse has what's called um, a lifetime earnings record. And oh, so you okay. try to put money on those horses. So you try to put um, either titles or money um, on those horses. And then that's what makes those horses worth more. And their okay. baby, their offsprings were, are worth more. And, okay. and gotcha, uh, yeah. all that sort so of thing. So it is and, important to do well in, in very these competitions. Much. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so like the dollars earned and set, the only reason I say that is because the money, um, the money earned is, it's like, those are the points. Like, so if we, yeah. if a horse has say $10,000 in earnings, then, then you can, if you're in the industry, you kind of know, okay, that horse has $10,000 in earnings. Um, so you kind of know what level that horse is. Like, right. um, if it's a, if it's won $10,000 in so many years, and then, then you kind of know, okay, that, that's kind of that you, you kind of have an idea what the level of horse you, you have. Gotcha. Yeah. So you kind of got put up into these upper levels and you were saying it was a bit of an eye opener for you. What's, what's yeah. kind of, uh, what th was that experience like? Oh, I just, I just got, I just got beat a lot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, you've been used to winning and then it, kind yeah, of that, that one yeah. year I had that one year of, uh, of, uh, glory where, where we basically won everything. And then, uh, and then the third year of competition, um, and was a lot tougher because, uh, because suddenly I was out of those lower, lower levels and that in the open, um, it just gets, it's just harder because, uh, there's only so many open level horses that are, you know, competitive at the, at the higher level. Okay. And again, I'm talking, I'm talking regionally here. I'm not talking like at the major events, like when you're talking major events uh, in North America, that's completely different. Like now we're talking a whole nother level. Like, like at this point I was still regional. Like I would travel to Quebec and, okay. uh, and mostly in Ontario and, if, and, you know, maybe cross the border into, um, New York and Michigan, but, <laughs> but at smaller shows, not the, not the major events. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So how long ago is this now at this point? Um, I guess probably five years ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So have you been competing, training ever since then? Is that kind of, yeah. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of how um, you got into that? And... Yeah. I think we've, we've been, uh, kind of competing now for maybe seven years now. I, yeah. It'd be about seven years. Okay. This, yeah. this might be the eighth year now of, uh, of, yeah, I think it would be the eighth year that we've been, gotcha. um, on our own, I guess. So are you always riding clients' horses in these competitions or do you have some of your own that you... For the most well? part, clients' horses. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I very seldom compete on my own horse. Um, but uh, the odd time, if I do happen to have one, um, I will okay. if it's good mm -hmm. enough or whatever. But uh, but yeah, for the most part, no, it's mostly clients' horses. Yeah, very good. And also as far as your 
your business or um, I'm not sure how you refer to it exactly, I guess, but you said that you have some assistance, like do you have people working for you or yeah. how, how has that grown mm -hmm. or how has that kind of developed over the last few years? Um, yeah. So in this industry, like to kind of get started on your own, the only way there's not really a, there is courses you can take like at school to learn horse training. There's a, there's a school in Alberta called oh, old, okay. old college. Um, and there's another one, um, there's one in Ohio called Findlay, I believe, okay. um, where you can go. And some of them, like they have, some of them have actually good programs, like to, to learn kind of the basics. I think the, the best thing about going to, um, a college program like that to learn about training horses would be the best part of that would probably be to learn the business side of it, okay. like to learn yeah. how to run your business, how to run a horse training business, because it's a little different than some other businesses. Yeah because there's competition involved it's not like you're just train it's not like a trade where you just trade money for your time okay. or or so on like it like when there's competition involved it's a little different okay yeah um so i think that would be the the best um that that would be the best reason to go to a okay a college um program and and i i, I could i'm sure there's people that have that have uh that could prove me wrong and show that they they have went to a college program and uh, learned how to actually train horses at a high level but for the most part the way you learn you need that hands-on experience and you okay. have to have um you need mentors like i i still have like i have so many mentors that help me with specific areas of um of my horse training and uh um, and so basically the assistants and in my barn that the reason they're there, um, is, is to learn there. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they are, they are working for Martin Ranch to learn the ins and outs of mm -hmm. horse training. And, uh, and it gives them an opportunity to be around a lot of different types of horses, mm -hmm. be around horse training. And I try to coach them as well as I can. And then mm -hmm. if they get to a certain level, then they, they, um, they, uh, they'll compete with clients horses, oh, okay. um, yeah. in the lower divisions to start with. And then, yeah, so that, that's kind of a, no, it's, it's actually been fun. We've had some, we've had some good horsemen and women that have kind of worked for us over the last several years. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So. How many do you have at a time? Uh, with? it varies a little bit. Um, I think right now we have, three okay um, and and they and they don't just ride they uh they help with the the all they help with ev with every part of it we have um um so jeff martin he does like all of our all of our groundwork and prep for oh our, yeah for uh, um like the starting the colts and stuff he's really that's kind of his specialty nice. he's really yeah. good at it and so he does that and then right now we have um amber reel she does um she does a uh, um, quite a bit of, um, the riding as well. And, and, uh, and, um, yeah, just working on, on body control on horses. She's, okay. she's good at that. And we have Jeanette Martin there as well. Um, and, and she kind of does the same thing and, and all of them have different strengths. So, yeah. so we try to pass horses around between us quite a bit. Oh, okay. Like, so I'll get on one, um, one day and I'll feel something and then they'll get on mine and, and uh, and we just kind of kind of try to feel feel what's going on with the different horses, and we try different things, and yeah, we kind of work as a team. Yeah. Um, it's not really a yeah, it, it's it's very much a team team effort because even when I go go away to the bigger shows and stuff, it's it's super important that I have people I can trust that are still working the right, horses yeah. that are at home, right? So it's yeah. uh, so it's so important to have to have good quality riders working for you as well yeah yeah so are you like does a horse need to be ridden every day um, um it, it really depends on the horse okay. um yeah for the most part yes like um like as a general rule yeah every day is is ideal okay um but there's there's different scenarios like maybe a horse there's might be horses that that don't stay sound if you work them every day oh, and so okay. so we also do a lot of um we have an exerciser like a, a walker so where the horse goes into this, uh, into this uh, round pen, and there's panels that it just goes around, and like oh, and there's okay. arms that just go around, and it it just kind of keeps so they them walk around walking, in a circle. Yeah. yeah. So so uh, we use that that sort of thing as well, mixed with turnout time and and time off. Like sometimes sometimes horses need need a little bit of time off. Like if okay. you just keep riding them every day, and then sometimes 
they need different types of writing. Like uh, maybe maybe um, we'll just um, maybe someone uh, will just take them out on a trail ride hmm. that day instead of being drilled on and stuff like that. So there's yeah. they yeah there's all different. Like as far as do they get worked every day? Yeah, but it just depends on what they need like yeah. that day maybe they just need some desensitizing that day maybe okay. we need to do some groundwork and go back to the basics and for a few days and um um so yeah there's there's so many different scenarios um yeah but they do need attention every day they every day requires something from you for yeah. sure whether it's whether it's actually being rode that day or or not um or whether it's being drilled on on a certain maneuver or whatever maybe maybe it's just some some maybe they just need to be trotted around the arena for 20 minutes and that's all yeah. they need that day but uh, um or maybe if it's a really um hypersensitive kind of a hyperactive horse maybe the best thing that day is maybe while i'm coaching i just sit on it and okay. we just stand there for an hour while i'm coaching and sometimes that's the best thing mentally for a horse is, is just to hang out there and not not think that we're going to go out there and have to do something. And I see. so you yeah. kind of have to really, yeah, you really have to like every single, and people say this all the time in our industry that, oh, every horse is different, but literally every single horse is different. Okay. Like, it actually matters. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. And um, maybe we'll, you'll uh, come back to a few things um, from your story. If you think of it as we move on and uh, um, talk about, specifically some of the things that you do and um, that kind of thing but well it's really interesting to to hear kind of how you've gotten to this point and um and um how you've de developed along the way and, and things like that um i was curious though so you you have your own place now um your own um ranch how long have you um, been there now yeah we we bought that place five years ago okay. um we uh we moved there about four and a half years ago i guess okay um nice. So, yeah. So have you been able to kind of develop it for what works well for you? And yeah, stuff? we have a pretty good um, system there now, a pretty good uh, setup. We have um, we have the indoor arena and the okay. outdoor arena and then the cattle pens um, for keeping the cattle. And we have um, most of the pastures are, well, all the pastures are fenced and we have some river bottoms and, oh, and neat, bush yeah. out the back where we keep some cattle back there and and that's fenced as well. Um, we do have, still have, it's an ongoing thing. We okay. have more fencing that needs to be done. Like some of the old original fences that were there are getting pretty run down. So in the near future, we, we're going to need to do some, some work there to kind of uh, replace some of those, okay. those fences. But, uh, but uh, yeah, no, for the most part, like, yeah, there's, there's several projects I can think of right off the top of my head that we want to, that we want to do to kind of make the place better. But uh but no, it it's been really nice to be there compared to what we were working with before. Yeah, uh, yeah we had I think the original um, arena was it was just an old hay shed, so it was only forty feet wide, okay. and uh, about a hundred. Well, when I started, I had it for part of the hay shed, so I had it forty feet wide by eighty feet long, and that was my my in when I very first started, I had no indoor arena. And then when I got that 40 by 80, I was like, okay, now this is pretty nice. I get to <laughs> be inside. And then that, that got to feeling pretty cramped when I was working with the, with the better and better horses. And oh, so okay. I, so I, um, I, uh, took over the rest of the hay shed there that was on that farm. And uh, so okay. then we had 40 by 120, but it was still pretty narrow. Okay. Um, and then, then when we moved to the new place, um, uh, I guess four and a half years ago there, then, uh, then we had an 80, it was 80 feet wide. So twice the width wow. and 160 feet long, which is not a huge arena by today's standards, but it felt huge when, yeah. from what we were used to. So. so was that there? Did you have to get that built? No, we built that okay, after yeah. we, yeah, that's, so we bought the place five years ago and then over the winter we, we added the arena and we added to the barn okay. um, as well. And then, so you've kind of had to make it work for what you're doing. Yeah, and, kind of and thing, it yeah. actually worked out pretty good because um, by the time we moved there or by the time we were ready to buy a place, we had a per we had been doing it long enough that we had a pretty good idea of what the, like what type of a setup yeah, we wanted. So, so sense. it worked pretty good. And yeah, like there's a few little changes that I would make if I was building another place, but, uh, 
but it, it works pretty good the way it is. We're, we're pretty happy with it. Yeah, no, that makes and that's nice that you had that chance to kind of figure out what's what you want. And then um, if you'd have done it in the first year or two, you might have had more of those things that you're like, oh, I wish this oh, was different. For sure. Too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I'm a, um, as you know, I, I know very little about the things that you're talking about. So it's just fascinating to me. Um, so excuse me if uh, some of these questions are a little basic, but I'd like to know kind of some of the basics of of horse training, some of the things that you're doing or, or looking for. Um, so maybe to start, what's what kind of is the age of the horse when you start training them or um, working with them, or what's that process like? Um, so it varies a lot when it comes to just uh, the backyard horses. We get them at, at pretty much any age. Um, okay. Like I just had one come in yesterday that was fi- that's fi- fifteen years old, and uh, okay. it's already been worked with some, but uh, but uh, yeah, those kind of are any age. But the performance horses, for the most part, um, are we start them at two years old. So we'll start okay. them at the at the early in their two year old year. So uh, in like January, February. So so um, in the perform or in in the horse world in general, all of the horses turn have a birthday on January the first. So if they were born in May they are technically still three-year-olds as of um january 1st so so that we call them we call them whatever age so if it's a if they were going to turn two in june then uh on january 1st they're already two even though they're not two we still call them two-year-olds so we start them for the most part the performance horses unless there's like an exceptional case where they like are you know really like too small to start or oh yeah or seem really uh, immature mentally or or physically um th- then we'll we'll give them some more time to grow up but mm-hmm. uh but um yeah pretty as a general rule kind of early in that two-year-old year uh-huh. is kind of when we start the performance horses and we just start them very lightly um and it, it is kind of an in our industry it's a kind of a <clears throat> controversial topic um because a lot of people feel that we should leave them longer let them develop more mature more physically okay. before mm-hmm. we start um before we start riding them and stuff but but um it it really it really comes down to how how you're working with them if you're Mm -hmm. if you're riding them hard as at that age that's not ideal at all like ideally i i kind of um always look at it as if you look at hockey players or any professional athlete if you pick up a stick at 20 years old and you think you're going to go play professional hockey, it's not going to work <laughs> right, out very yeah. well for you, right? Like that, the hands on a 20-year-old that picks up a stick and is trying to learn it are never going to look like the hands on um, on a kid that started, like they start at like three years old or right, whatever yeah. now, like, and they, and they, they just, so it becomes just second nature because, and it's not that they're getting, it's not that they're slamming each other into the boards. Right, yeah, at, it's at, very different hockey at four at three, years old, yeah, right? Yeah. Like you watch Timbit hockey or whatever, <laughs> yeah. right? Like it's, but they're learning, they're learning the footwork and they're mm-hmm. learning that how to, you know, that how to stick handle and things like that. And that's what we're teaching these young horses in okay. that first year of their training. That first, the the two year old year, like we're just teaching them the the basics. We're teaching them the form that they need. So we're teaching them the footwork that they need for the spins and the and the timing and the balance in those stops and okay. and just those just those basic things how to give to pressure um and uh like so we teach them to to move away from pressure on, from our legs and from okay. our hands and mm-hmm. so we just teach them those basics it's not that we're going to try and 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 uh do high performance maneuvers with those babies um but we're teaching them the fundamentals of that so that as they develop and become stronger and older now they have the strength to be pushed more and to do more but they already have those basics exactly yeah yeah it's very much like a like a professional athlete that starts out at a at a very very young age if you can teach them that footwork and those that that two-year-old year they're so they they just absorb they're like sponges like okay. they they learn so quick and you don't work them very long they're they're like kids as well in the way that um their attention span is like is like 15 minutes like <laughs> max like like those so you babies notice the difference from oh the, very okay, very much yeah and you develop that attention span as well and okay, as yep. they get older but no like in the in the beginning that that beginning of that two-year-old year i might work with a two-year-old for 10 minutes in a like okay. that day and that might be all that 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 might be all I get that day. Okay. Well. Um, and so it's really important to just keep the sessions really short 
and uh and light and but be very very consistent like they need that that especially in that in the beginning there they need that daily mm -hmm. every single day just a little bit of time and and if you put it i had an old um had a trainer tell me tell me one time he said if you put it on slow it will stick and oh, okay. uh, and that's yep. so true like if you try to try to cram cram it onto these babies at a young age um it always spells trouble down the road if you okay. if you just yep. teach them really slowly a little bit every day um that will that 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 foundation um yeah you can always go back to that foundation even if oh, you yeah. even if you get that horse five six years later and someone's kind of messed up what you've you know maybe kind of messed up the training mm -hmm. or they uh you know maybe it was just an inexperienced rider and they were allowing little habits to develop mm -hmm. if they had that solid foundation early on you can always go back to that and those horses can always be be um recouped at that point okay. but it, yeah. but those early years are so so important like if you if you put that on um wrong in that two-year-old year if they learn the wrong footwork or they learn the right. wrong habits um they always revert back to that oh and, yeah uh, so that's and, much worse than them learning some bad habits at five or six years absolutely old. Yeah. yeah a five-year-old that learns bad habits that had a good foundation in the beginning you can often like you can often step on that horse and 15 minutes later it looks like a completely different okay animal. yeah yeah because they have that foundation yeah so what uh what age would they start competing um, so the earliest that our horses are allowed to compete at are as three-year-olds, and those okay. are called futurities. Um, so when we take horses to futurities, those are that's the first that's the first year of competition for those horses, and that's kind of the big, like in the cow horse and the reining uh, and the cutting industries. Um, those they're definitely like the futurities are a big. Those are a big. Um, um, there's a lot of emphasis on the futurities. That's kind okay. of where, where a lot of the money and the focus is. But then after that, so after their three-year-old year, now it's called derbies. So the derbies yeah. in reigning are from four until seven mm -hmm. years old. And the cow horse, they're four and five-year-olds. And, and so there's different, um, yeah, just di those are just different different divisions. And, and yeah. so those are kind of what you call limited aged events so they're they're those are based on the horse's age okay yeah. um and then then we have like in the regional at the regional level you have what you call um we have what they call horse like weekend horse shows so that that's a com those are measured in a completely d different way okay um those are usually based on rider earnings and stuff oh, so okay. they're they're the, they're the limiting factor is usually the rider uh, um yeah. but then as far as aged events um like at, at the bigger like the bigger aged events um those are based on the horse's age okay yep so are they doing different types of competition like lighter stuff when they're three years old or is it very similar to what no they're doing not the really um so in the so they, they, there's, there's a few little thing, little changes. So you do like the, all the same stuff that the older horses are doing, but they'll make it a little easier. So like, for instance, in the cow horse world, um, you get to ride them, um, in what we call a snaffle bit. So it's just a, just a broken bit with a ring on each side and you get to ride with two hands. So you okay. can pull them left and right and you can, you can help them out a little more. And then as they get older, they they move into what we call a hackamore it's a rawhide braided nose band or nose piece um that goes over the nose and you can still ride them with two hands and then as they get a little older so once they're six years old and then they then they go into a two rein setup so they'll have they'll have a bit in their mouth but okay. they'll still also have the rawhide braided nose piece um and so, so you can still, so now you have to ride them one handed okay. and hold two sets of reins in your hands, but you can use that nose piece as that hack, you call it a basilita. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so you can use them to, to that, to kind of help direct your horse a little bit and okay. get them used to the feeling of the bit in their mouth. And then once they're seven years old, now they're what you call a bridle horse. They're, they're finished horse okay. um, straight up in the, in the bridle. And so that's like a, um. That is um, kind of that's what we call like a I guess that's what we call a finished horse. Okay. And um, and at that point they're kind of that's the that that's when they're at their highest their highest level a uh, level. At, okay. at that point and they're that now they're only allowed to be shown one handed um, in a, a 
uh, specially approved bridal. So there's different bits that are legal or, or not legal. And so okay. there's kind of an indis or there's a national standard for those, for those bits. But, uh, so it takes until a horse is that old to, to be kind of considered fully trained or yeah, yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. Okay. No, it's uh it's uh, um, so like, yeah, like I said, you're doing all the same things at three years old. Yeah. Um, but you have to help that horse through a lot of situations at that age. Okay. Um, so then like, especially with when the cow horse world where you have that, there's so many different scenarios, a cow, every cow is going to work differently. So there's yep. so many different scenarios a cow can throw at you. Um, that, uh, that yeah they they kind of keep that um so traditionally where it started was the four and um four and five year old year a horse is losing a lot of a lot of baby teeth and caps oh, okay. are coming out of their mouth so um so they traditionally went into a hackamore during those years um so that they don't have a bit in their mouth so to so it was it was developed um um years ago like the spaniards um that oh, okay. moved up here um developed that years ago so they they kind of worked around a horse's age okay that yep. way just to because they were horsemen and they were they tried to to um yeah they were trying to respect the horse right. that, that the mouth might be sensitive during that time so they um they work in a hackamore for for a few years um and then the, the cow horse industry just has kind of adopted that and kind of made it um so made separate classes for those age of horses like oh, four okay. and five year olds you, they, yeah. and hackamore classes and so on so it's just kind of to keep their traditions alive as is, is why they've why they've um developed that they've okay. the two rain there's special um two rain um classes for horses that are in that two rain year mm -hmm. of their life and then and then bridal horse bridal classes for the finished horses okay. and so they've kind of developed they've kind of kept that those they're trying to keep those traditions alive i guess okay yeah. so it's not necessarily that it's necessary for for a horse to have that that uh type of uh would you call it a hackamore no it's it's not um okay. it yeah. de like you can train a horse really you can train a horse with anything okay with any sort of gear but um it's a lot it's a lot easier with the proper gear and definitely I think there's definitely value in getting out of a horse's mouth and, and training them in that hackamore for a while. Okay. It makes, it keeps that mouth fresh for down the road. And, um, there's a, there's a ton of value in that. It's not that you have to do it. Okay. There's, and just like you don't have to use, um, you don't have to use that certain brand name bit on a horse, okay. but that yeah. doesn't mean I don't still want one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. So how, how long will a horse compete then? Like what are some of the older, oldest horses that are still competing? Um, that, that really depends on the horse. Like, okay. and, and you know, their physical ability, how, how long they're able to stay sound and, and everything. Like yeah. there's horses that, um, like usually once they get, you know, into their teen years, they're not going to be competing generally. There's exceptions to that rule, but they're not going to be competing at, uh, at a high level of uh, like maybe the highest open level anymore but at that point they might be babysitting some kids they might be you know some kids might be showing them in like the oh yeah 13 and under or maybe they're youth horses like oh, okay. and yep. for the youth classes or um or maybe non-pro um they might be showing in, in some of the lower like the amateur or non-pro divisions okay um, in the lower good, divisions yeah. or whatever um yeah, there's definitely, if you look after one, they can last for a bit. Like I know horses that have shown into their twenties. Okay. Um, but, uh, but definitely. And once they get a little older like that, you usually, most people try to take a little bit of the pressure off uh, them okay. and, and, and allow them to compete in a, in a, um, class that is more, a little more, uh, just has a little less pressure and they can kind mm -hmm. of, uh, usually those horses are great babysitter horses like what i mean by that is like just they'll fill in the gaps for a more amateur rider right yeah um like yeah. they'll they'll kind of they know their job well enough that if the rider doesn't help them out just right in a certain situation the horse will do it anyway okay sort yeah. of thing so uh so that's usually where those horses fit as they get a little as they get a little older yeah yeah that's that makes sense um what is the lifespan on a on a typical horse uh, I don't know what the average lifespan would be like generally, you know, into their 
mid twenties is probably, okay. yep. but I definitely know of horses. There's a lady in our industry, Joanne Milton. Um, she has horses that are oh probably close to forty years old. Oh wow! Like, okay. Um, like, so yeah, uh, they can. Yeah, they, they can, can last a very yeah. long time. I I know of a horse. I know a lady that owned a horse that I think she hit. I, or I think he hit 50. Wow. He was really, it was really close that he was in the Guinea's World Book of Records. Okay. So like, um, yeah, there's, there's some really old horses, but that's the, that's the exception. Okay. Not the rule. Yeah. I would say on average, probably mid twenties. Yeah. No, very good. Um, yeah. So you've been talking about competition horses and, and things like that. So there's different types of competitions I've kind of gathered and we'll get a little more, um, into that. Um, are you doing other types of training? I think you mentioned a few things like just the backyard horse you, you said, are you doing other things too? Or, um, is that, is that pretty much it? The competition in, in backyard horses? Um, yeah. Um, backyard horses, some problem, like problem horses. Like if someone, you know, if brings in a horse with a, just a, maybe a box or maybe it oh, okay, doesn't yeah. want to tie. So like it, it'll pull back when it's tied or, okay. or, um, maybe it's just really spooky. Like it might just be like kind of, maybe it's not confident enough on a trail to take its rider down a trail and oh, be yeah. like a dependable horse. Maybe it's kind of a spooky type of horse. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, no, there's the, all those types of horses that come through as well. Yeah. Very good. You've also <clears throat> been, uh, been talking about how, each horse is different and you have to be obviously aware of the well-being of the horse. So what are some of the things that you do to, to maintain their well-being and make sure that uh, they're being well taken care of? Um, yeah. So um, a big part of that is diet. Um, mm -hmm. we, we do try to have a really um, good quality diet for them. Um, um, one of my sponsors is Perina Feeds and they, they, uh, they have a whole... Um, lab the where they just oh, okay. they just work on like the the highest quality of um of feed for the for the horses for different ages of horses right from from weanlings all the way up to the to the senior horses um they've got okay. all different and for different levels of of or like yeah to, based on how hard the horse is working and mm. stuff so diet is a huge one yeah. um good quality hay is super important and then the other part of that is just the regular exercise like like i said we have that horse exerciser um that will put the uh put the horses on and uh um, right yep. and so just that regular movement at a <laughs> walk is super <clears throat> super important and i i do put some poles in there usually for them to step over just so they oh, okay. engage their core as they're walking mm -hmm. um just basic just little stuff like that um that's super important and then also making sure that those horses have plenty of warm-up time at the start of each ride like oh, that you okay. don't just jump on them and start working on high pressure maneuvers right away that you make sure you warm them stretch them out like bend them and stretch them from side to side and okay. just do yeah just really try to make sure that they warm up properly yeah do you um do horses ever get injured like do you have to be do you have to watch carefully like that um that there's not something wrong or oh or for sure like that. yeah yeah i know yeah, that's that's a huge huge part of it i have a um and and i think every trainer does have a have a a good vet that they depend mm -hmm. on yeah. um so we'll yeah they get all kinds of like um we have we have uh the, all of the higher end horses they'll they'll get regular massage and chiropractic oh, okay. work as well um that's a huge part of it and um and also um um yeah along with that having a good vet on board that like to use um to to you know like we'll uh um yeah there's i mean there's injections that you can do for their for their hawks like hyaluronic acid just like baseball players would in their oh, okay, elbows yep. and stuff like that there's different uh different things that you can do if a horse um if a in the in the high impact areas like their back legs like their hawks and their mm -hmm. um um yeah, their joints. That's a oh yeah. That's a a huge part of it. We try not to um, use too many invasive um, measures, like too many needles in the joints and stuff like that. Um, a big a big thing that's really coming in um, that people are using a lot now, um, and my vet uses quite a bit is shockwave therapy. So we do quite a bit of shockwave therapy on okay. our horses now as well. That that really seems to promote the healing and stuff. And oh so, okay. So yeah, that's a a big one. Yeah, very good. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to say on um, horse training before um, we look at or talk more about some of the competitions you're doing and things like that? 
Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm sure there's, I could go on and on about yeah. horse training forever. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, uh, yeah, it, it's something I'm super passionate about. So I, I, I'll gladly talk to anyone about horse training for however long they yeah, want to. Uh, but, uh, but no, great. I think we kind of covered the, the, the basics there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you've, uh, you mentioned the three different type of types of competitions. I think I have this right. Cow horse reining and cutting. Is that, <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Those are the three that, uh, we're mostly involved okay, in. Yeah. Um, there's, there's tons of others right, as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's uh and then there's the English world where that you know jumping and dressage and all of that. Okay, so that's and, um, that's kind of a different That's a totally origin? different. Yes, also a different origin. Yeah, that's more more um that more comes from from um I guess Europe like um that it would have a completely different background. Like all of our western disciplines would originate from the cowboy like you know the okay, cowboy yeah. lifestyle like working like working using horses on ranches to do actually like to do jobs whereas the dressage and like the english world that all originates more from the um from um using horses in the military oh, um okay. so like they're, they're like yeah fighting using horses and for fighting and stuff like that and dressage yeah. is that like all of the maneuvers in a dressage test actually come from um different um things that they would like so like a pee off or passage where the horse is like kind of um you know dance or whatever okay, in, yep. in prance in place um in one spot that was originally used to like trample a soldier okay. like <laughs> like um so like it's so every everything in whether it's the english or the western yeah. disciplines they kind of they originate from somewhere so like in reigning um, in the Western discipline, we have we have spins in the reining where yeah, the horse spins yeah. around. Um, so that was originally just to so to show like like or that was originally just so that you could maneuver left and right quickly um, oh, to okay. stop a cow. And then uh, so was it more of like a training procedure, or do you have to actually like spin three times when you're when you're working with a cow? No, it's like that? that's the thing about all of these disciplines is is competition in competition we've taken all of these things and taken them more to the extreme right and to the point where they're not necessarily practical anymore like right, it's not yeah. super practical unless you want a 360 degree view of your pasture <laughs> it's not super practical to go out in the middle of the field and just spin around yeah. <laughs> you know you can kind of swivel your head and look left and right you don't have to actually spin your horse around <laughs> but the well, more just, minu- <laughs> just to throw that in there like in sports the the sports that we watch and enjoy aren't that practical for, for exactly. real life either exactly. right <laughs> Yeah, 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 it's that's exactly yeah. You know, you can swing, you can swing a baseball bat, or you can swing a sledgehammer, but there you're gonna do it different ways yeah, a little yeah, bit, exactly. right? So yeah. Anyway, sorry. Back to um, where some of those come from, where that kind of thing. Yeah. So they, we've just basically taken <clears throat> taken um, different ori- that were originally practical maneuvers mm-hmm. and on a ranch, and we've just kind of expanded on them, and they've to become over the years become more and more technical, and and the judges watch for like even if you look like you look 20 years ago even the sport even 10 years ago the sport is is evolving constantly okay yeah yeah so like they're they're more technical now or yeah yeah yeah, they're they're just looking like the the degree of difficult like the competition just keeps getting harder every Uh, single year and um and a big part of that is the horses like the breeders are breeding more and more athletic horses so like they've taken the champions and bred them to champions and bred them to champions and they just keep getting more and more evolved and more athletic and mentally can handle um the training like they're they can handle that pressure and uh so they so they've just evolved and and bred or and there's always um ones that don't work out like you know the horses that you know were supposed to be champions because of their breeding but yeah. they, they didn't make it um but definitely yeah a big part of that is the breeding of the horses okay. like they've they've yeah. evolved so much and and the, it yeah the industry is constantly evolving like it's it's a it's tough just to to keep up sometimes because okay. it's like yeah just the smallest little details um it can make such a huge difference yeah. 
Well, it's, I mean, that that's come through in just the few interviews that I've done in here with different people in their areas, like how fast things are changing and new things are, are coming in. So that doesn't surprise me at all to hear that that's the case in, in your industry as well. I, I think with the internet and stuff as yeah. well, that's made a huge difference because even when I, when I was a kid, um, we would try to, like, I was always trying to learn and, and wanted to learn different training techniques and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But I had to, basically, I would learn them by reading a magazine right. and, and, like, yeah. articles in a magazine, of um, training articles that trainers would write or whatever. And now you can go on YouTube and, and Yeah, watch you go on it. YouTube yeah. and, and not all of it is good. There's definitely yeah. <laughs> there's definitely some YouTube uh, clips that I would, I would not recommend to try to emulate. But... Um, but there's, yeah, there's so much information out there now. There's so many virtual horse training websites where you can, oh, yeah. you can like subscribe to a monthly, <laughs> um, you know, a monthly subscription and you get like so much content every month and oh, okay. stuff like that. So there's, yeah. there's just, and, and people that have specialized in that, in the coaching and, in, oh, yeah. and then teaching people. So there's so much information available. And the speed of the information, like you talk about with your magazines, that takes time to, to, for someone to develop new techniques and then write about it, publish it, get it sent out to you where with the internet that, that whole yeah. process speeds up so quickly. Yeah. And, that, and there's ups and downs to that. Like well, I yeah, definitely, sure. yeah. Like I have, I have students now that, um, sometimes that I can tell they've been, they've, they know, they have so much head knowledge, oh, um, okay. that it almost is overwhelming for them because they almost second guess everything they do because there's so much contradicting information out there because horse training is not one of those things that is like you know if you you know it's not like elect like being an electrician Mm -hmm. where you put the red wire here and the green wire here and this will happen right yeah so it's there's so many variables every horse is so different so so there's so much contradictive information out there Uh, that that you can have as much head knowledge as you want um you really you need that hands-on experience to to get good at it. Like you need to develop that feel for a horse. And, and, uh, so I always tell my students like, like for every hour that you spend on the internet or watching horse training videos, you should be spending at least twice that time on an actual horse. Like if you, it's so easy now with their phones and stuff like people on their lunch break, they're just scrolling through training videos and different little clips and stuff. And that's great to have all that information there. But but if you're not getting that actual time yeah. um, on a horse and 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 with with eyes watching you that are like they keeping you accountable for what you're doing, oh, like, yeah. like I I do a ton of that. There's a a, guy, a good friend of mine, Matt Hudson, um, up near Toronto. He he helps me on a regular basis. We'll like we'll send video clips back and forth oh, of okay. our horses and like, hey, what do you think of this and what do you think of that and and uh, and he like he's got a super good eye for that sort of thing okay. so he'll yeah. he'll just tell me oh just when you run down there um just pull on your left rein a little or whatever oh, okay. and yeah. uh, instead and 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 yeah I'll, I'll okay the next morning that's what i'm gonna try yeah. and uh and yeah most of the time like it's just so good to have that 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 set of eyes keeping you accountable to what you're doing. I yeah. don't even know how we got to that. Kind yeah. Of topic, well, but. and that's, that's kind of a neat thing. Like you wouldn't have had that as easily 10 years ago either that you can just exchange videos of yourselves training and uh, um, riding horses and then give feedback that quickly. Like, yeah, it's great and then, how yeah. technology helps out in, in so many different places and ways. Yeah. It just speeds up. And that, that's another reason why the industry is evolving so quickly. Right. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely upsides to it and as well as yeah. downsides like everything, I guess. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'd like if you describe a little bit. Um, so obviously we're focused on, on what you're, uh, what, what you're involved in, what you're doing. So do you want to tell me a little bit about the, each of those types of things like what they are cow horse reining and cutting for people like me that don't know much about it at all yeah most, so most of my experience with it is coming going to the royal winter fair occasionally and watching uh okay some horse yep. shows there so yeah that's a lot of people's uh, in this area that's yeah. a lot of people's experience of horse shows so so and that and that's what's um and something like the royal winter fair um 
in the like there you're watching jumping and that's a relatively easy concept for people to understand yeah, a lot yeah. of times like there's a fence you jump over it you don't knock it down you win yeah. the ribbon right yeah. it's pretty pretty uh it's a you basic can get it within 10 minutes of watching you know? <laughs> exactly it's yeah. pretty easy to, to to grasp the concept and that's what's so cool about um some of those sports that are very they're very easy to follow you don't yeah. need to and rodeo is similar in that way like you know you you rope the calf and tie it or whatever yeah. in the quickest amount of time or you you know you stay on the bull for eight seconds like it's a, those are easy concepts to understand yeah. in our industry it's a little bit different um because we have the to the untrained eye a lot of it can look so similar but what mm -hmm. the judges are looking for is those little those subtle like those subtle differences. So what we're basically getting judged on in all three of those those disciplines, reining, cutting, and cow horse, in all three of those disciplines, we're being judged on our horsemanship, basically. So, okay. so they're looking at like how in tune is that horse with its rider and how... Um, how easy does the, does the, do those maneuvers look? So in reining, for example, we'll, we'll have a set pattern that we have to do on a horse. So we, we'll maybe do, we'll maybe walk into the center of the arena and spin four times to the left and four times to the right. So, so each maneuver, so that judge, as you walk in, those judges are trained to, um, to, analyze that first maneuver which would be four spins to the left okay so so they'll analyze those four spins to the left and they'll decide they'll give that maneuver a score from uh from minus one and a half to plus one and a half okay zero would be a correct maneuver without any degree of difficulty like just okay. just a correct maneuver with no degree of difficulty um, and speed is what dictates the degree of difficulty. Okay, yep. The faster you do it, the higher the degree of difficulty. But because it's harder to do it faster and still maintain correct form. So right. just because you do it fast doesn't mean you'll get a high score because the horse's form might be off. Okay. Right. Yep. So so that's what they're what they're watching. And so it takes a little bit of so to the untrained eye, they'll watch a horse spin around and they might think, yeah, they look good, or they. Um, and it looked just like the last one, but, uh, as you watch it more and more and you, and you, and even you start to ride horses and you, uh, and like you that. feel those things, you start to learn to know what a good spin looks like. And then, yeah. and so that's the one maneuver and then there'll be circles. Um, so like to running from a fast circle into a slow circle and that transition, how smoothly does it happen? How easily does that horse come back into a slow circle without you needing to pull on the bridle and, you know. You, um, pull on that bit and you've probably all seen like around here when people see horses they might see them in a buggy or something mm -hmm. like that and they're at a stop sign and they're pulling on the reins and the horse is tossing its head up yep. and down and there's a lot of resistance going on there um, that's what we're trying to avoid so we're trying oh, to okay. it's supposed to look like you and the horse are one like you have the same thoughts like there's no okay. there's no resistance there there's no like um, that horse pulling on the reins to try and go faster when you're asking oh, it yeah. to slow down and yep. and then there's more technical man maneuvers like lead changes and like when a horse you might notice even when your dog is running how that if they're when when they're on the right lead that would be when the right front foot and the right hind foot are ahead of the left front foot and the left hind foot right okay um yep. so so like when a when a when a horse or a dog or something runs they don't run com with their their front feet completely beside each other and their left and their oh, hind okay, feet completely yeah. beside each other right there's always a, a leading foot okay right yep. so so we do lead changes where we ask them to switch that oh, okay. from a left lead to a right lead and and so on and those and how how smoothly do those changes happen okay. without without any visible cue um yep. and and then the the big man maneuver that everyone likes to watch is the sliding stops yeah, like yeah. when they you know you run that horse's as fast as they can run and then slide you might slide 20 30 feet or whatever are you <clears> trying and, for uh, a really long slide is that there again it's it's the same as um the spin it's not about the length of the slide so much as any more it used to be more like 25 years ago they, they would slide them a long ways and they would use they would do it on really fast dirt um okay. but now anymore we we usually show in a little bit deeper dirt and it's more it's not just about the length of the slide obviously a long slide is great as long but it's that form like you want that horse to really really hit the ground really hard and like like the the big stoppers 
of today, they'll like they'll bend in their back and they'll get really, really low to the ground and, oh, okay. and hit the ground really hard. And then they're supposed to stay loose up front, like their front feet are supposed to pedal. Okay, and so they back, keep moving. Yeah, yeah, and their back feet are, will hit the ground really hard and they'll go really deep into the ground and pedal with their front feet. And um, <clears throat> and so it's not really about the length of the slide, okay. but it's about the speed that they hit that stop and how yep. smooth they are. And then the length of the slide will be very much dictated on... Um, or what will dictate the length of the slide, sorry, will be the type of ground that you're stopping in, okay. whether yep. it's whether it's shallow or deep ground, and also the style of stop that that horse has. Some horses are what we call skaters, so they'll stay on top of the ground and they'll go a long oh, okay. ways. Mm -hmm. um, and then we the deep stoppers, um, they'll get to the bottom of that ground. Like they'll go really, really deep in the ground, so they won't slide very far, but they but they have a really powerful type of stop. Okay. Um, and that's better like that'll get you higher points um any yeah in today's competition it's getting more and more that way that okay. the skaters aren't really marking anymore because um because we've recognized well the, uh, the dirt has changed so there's people yeah. now that make a living on developing dirt for our arenas and stuff okay. like that well. so it's it's that even the dirt has evolved a um, in a big way in our industries as well. So that's the raining portion of it, or that's, that's raining in yeah. general. So I have, a, I have a question on that. Um, are you given that, that procedure just before the competition or is it the same every time? No, there's different patterns. So you can usually look ahead a few weeks at the major events. You'll know like a month ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yeah what the uh so what you the can patterns training, are yeah you can be for it yeah and and you can be training them but you're not going to be so that's something that people often ask like um you definitely don't practice um the pattern at home very much because you don't want the horse anticipating what's coming oh um, okay so so yeah you'll you'll maybe check the, the like spots in that pattern like you'll check parts of the pattern at home okay. but you don't go running that pattern a bunch of times because if the horse is ahead of you and knows what's coming and is and starts thinking on its own a little too much then uh then you're not going to score very high oh, because okay. that horse will be a, will clearly the, be the ahead judges of the will rider be able to tell that. yeah okay. oh yeah. yeah yeah so are you you said that it, you um you don't want them like pulling ahead and things like that um are you still signaling in some way to the horse when it's time to switch oh yeah procedures. yeah and so that's you... the that's the key, that's the key is that you that's what they're looking that they for. need to wait for those cues and okay. so, and so there's tons of cues that you'll use like with your a lot of them are with your legs okay legs yeah. are a huge part of it yeah. yeah no um you uh when i said that i watched um have watched horse shows at the royal winter fair you probably correctly assumed that i'm talking about uh, show jumping um but one time we went to a to a Monday night show, I think, and they were doing kind of a different, it was kind of a showcase of a bunch of different type of types of okay. um, riding and that kind of thing. And so I actually saw, that was the, the only time or the the first time too, obviously, that I saw okay. raining. How long ago was that? Oh, this goes back 10 or 15 years, probably. Okay. I think I know who that would have been. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it was, it was like just a show thing. Like, like they were just demonstrating basically. It wasn't a competition, but um, yeah. um, I remember that they had one guy out there that it must have been a younger horse that um, had. Um, so I remember, I remember that like you'd been talking about the he had two hands on the reins and um, and and was like kind of demonstrating. No one was real impressed. And then they brought out a, a much more um, more finished horse. Yeah, more finished horse. And the, I remember the rider had one one uh, one just one hand on the reins and coming from this uh from this younger horse just us in the crowd being very uneducated we were like we were quite impressed with, with that, how that the looked like looked. more fun yeah yeah and just, <laughs> yeah it looked, looked quite a bit more impressive but um, i was watching some of the videos on your facebook and, and things and so i recognized some of the some of the maneuvers that they were doing and what you were just talking about there so it's fascinating to hear oh that's cool that you that you actually have seen it yeah. before because yeah. most people haven't like yeah. when i try to explain to them what uh what reining is or what cow horse is or things like that they have no idea yeah. what, what what i'm talking about so i try to explain it to them and usually the best way to kind of for it to hit home is um if anybody and a lot of people in this area have have done that if they've rode a pony or something 
um, at someone's farm and that pony just wants to run back to the barn <laughs> and they know that feeling of getting ran off with and getting dragged back to the barn, then, uh, then they can appreciate a little bit how hard it is to develop that sort of, um, communication with a oh, horse to yeah. be able to run at a wide open speed and, and have them, you know, hit the ground, like f into a, a sliding stop with a, you know, a hair hair trigger touch or yeah, whatever okay. so that so if, if anyone's ever been run off with with a <laughs> with a pony or something like that they can usually kind of appreciate it a little bit more yeah is it a is it ever like scary the when you're riding a horse that's doing these these things or are you so used to it that uh only if uh if the horse is is like not you know not doing what it's supposed right, to or yeah. whatever but no for the most part it's not really so the the scariest per se um competition would be the reined cow horse okay where we where we go down the fence and on a like chasing a cow so so there so in the cow horse competition there is like is like three-day eventing i don't know if you've ever heard of three-day eventing in the english world so so there it's like dressage and and cross-country jumping and show jumping it's like so three. like the same horse will do all three yeah we'll do all three and then it like all three so they will combine or not? Like, no, is there they, one they're oh. one, one each day. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's why it's called three day venting. Yeah. So then, but then in, um, in the Western world, we have rain cow horse and that's, that's kind of the, um, that's the same. It's the Western version of three day eventing. Okay. So we have, there's raining and then there's cutting, which is also its own. It has its own national body. So raining, there's the NRHA and the national raining horse association. Cutting has the NCHA, the national cutting horse okay. association. And then cow horse has its own national body called the national rain cow horse association, the NRCHA. Okay. And, um, and in, in cow horse, it's a three, it's also three events. So in cutting, you have a herd of cattle and you bring one cow out of the herd and and then the rider is not allowed in your the rider is not allowed to to use the reins to um steer the horse at all okay. so so you just the horse will as instinct you teach that horse to to hold a cow on its own so you bring a cow out of the herd it tries to get back into the herd and it will make like quick moves kind of like a sheep dog like back and forth okay, in front of yeah. that cow to hold that cow and there's a lot of it's not just instinct on the horse's part there's a lot of training that goes into yeah, that as well right. obviously um but then uh but that's the that's cutting and there again it's a fairly the concept is easy to understand because um because you just bring a cow out and you try to keep it away from the herd but then there's like there's all different degrees of difficulty okay. and how those judges will score that run um, okay. yep. based on on uh, the difficulty of the cow, um, how bad it wants to get back into the herd. Okay. And, uh, and also that you can also get style points for like a horse that the horses that really have a lot of expression and like, like get really low to the ground and some of them will get down on their knees and if a cow isn't moving and they'll just be quivering in front, like they're so eager to work a cow, okay. um, that they'll just uh, like, it, it's an, it's a, it's an awesome feeling if you, when you sit on a really good one and they, they'll, they'll just drop down in front of a cow and every muscle is just quivering and they, they, they just like love ready to, to, to move to, left okay, or right yeah. with that cow. Like they're just, they're watching that cow. And if that cow thinks about moving one way or another, they're, they're, they, they can read the cow better than you or I can. Like they, okay. they yeah. know, yeah, they can, they just take over and you, uh -huh. t you train a cutting horse to take over and do the job on its own versus in reining you teach a horse to be dictated to completely. A horse is not okay. supposed to have a single thought of its of its own. Okay. That horse is supposed to only do exactly every footfall that horse has should be dictated to by the rider. Okay. Um, yep. But then in cutting, you teach that horse to um, to take over in front of oh, a cow. Okay. To you teach that horse to how to read it. Like you teach, you can't teach a horse to read a cow because that's bred into them but you um you teach them the proper form like how you want them to to turn just like a sheep dog like there's horses that are um or like working cattle dogs you know there's yeah. there there's dogs that will um that that's bred into them but then they still have to learn like how to use that like they have to learn the different cues when to go left yeah. when to go right when to yeah. stop and and lay down and all those things right it's the same way in in the um and like just because a horse has natural cow sense is cow sense is what we call okay, it. Okay. Yep. Um, if a horse has natural bred cow sense, um, that doesn't mean you can just 
turn it loose on a cow and okay. it's going to know yeah. what to do. It, it's going to want to do something, um, but it's not going to know how to harness that um, natural, right. yeah. that natural desire. So are these different horses? Like, I mean, like, are you doing, are some horses trained for reining and some horses trained for, for cow horse competitions? Or are you, do um, our horses do both? There is horses that can cross into the different disciplines okay. for sure. Yep. Um, I, I have been blessed to have a couple of those that have been able to be competitive in multiple events, but that's very rare, um, okay. that they can cross over into the different national bodies because in the NRHA, the the reigning horses that's all they do so they have they all their time goes into being right, okay. the best reigning horses yeah. and in the ncha all their time goes into being the best cutting horses so it's really there's definitely horses there's reigning horses that have gone into cutting and been successful and vice versa okay um but it's it's rare and then the what makes the cow horse unique the rain cow horse association is that you do three events so you do the cutting oh, okay. you do the cutting as well it's a little bit different you're allowed to help your horse a little bit with your hand oh, um, okay. yep. to um on the reins like you're allowed to pick up your hand a little bit to help guide those horses okay. in the cutting and then in the reining it's the same as the reining it's just and it's a little bit different in the sense that you get to um Again, they they just judge it a little differently. The dirt is usually a little deeper, okay. um, so they don't slide as far generally. Um, and you can use your hand a little bit more to guide them. Okay. Um, it's uh, still the same on in both disciplines. It's still the exact the 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 objective is still the same. But then the third discipline that you have in the cow horse is when is where you have a a cow you let they let one cow into the arena and you have to guide that cow through a series of maneuvers so okay. so you what you first thing you do is what is called boxing so you box the cow on the end of the arena and then you run it down the wall okay. at at full speed usually and then you try to stop it before it gets to the you have to you have to drive it past the middle marker but you have to stop it before it gets to the end marker and then and you have to do one turn each way at least you can do okay. more, but you have to do a minimum of one turn each way. And then you have to circle the cow one full circle each way in the middle of the arena. And, and you're, and you have to, and generally they're using fresh cattle that can run. Oh, okay. So, so you, so you're going wide open and, uh, and that's, so when you said about, um, when you, what you said earlier about, is it ever scary? When people think scary in the Western world, often they're thinking like the, the the fence work going down the fence oh, on a on a I horse see. that 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 third discipline of of the, in the rain cow horse which is that what we call fence work mm -hmm. um that is where that is where the that's probably what is could be the scariest um because you're going wide open there's another animal in there you're traveling beside and then you step in front of it going wide yeah. open and try to stop it okay um and uh and and it's not and and it's all so people often think that looks scary when you're going that speed and, yeah. and hitting the ground in front of another animal yeah. that's also running that speed and there is definitely there's wrecks that happen occasionally but um they're very rare if they're if it's done properly if you if you have the proper instruction and like, like for sure anytime there's animals accidents can happen yeah um but um but no, for the most part, it's not really, you're not even thinking about the speed because you're just watching the cow yeah. and the same with the horse. Like, like people often wonder if horses get excited running that fast and stuff. And the good ones don't because they're just watching the cow and they're not even thinking about how fast they're going. They're just running beside that cow and watching that cow and whether they're going 40 mile an hour or five mile an hour, they don't care because they're just they're just doing okay. what the cow does yeah and uh and so so yeah when you said about is it sometimes scary that's probably the event that would seem the scariest to watch because yeah. but it's also the most exciting to watch because you have that um yeah just going that speed down the fence and with a with a cow and it can yeah. get pretty western sometimes and then, so that's that's kind of a yeah kind of a yeah kind of fun i should uh i don't think i've ever like watched videos of this or anything but um are you like do you have to pass and get in front of the, the cow or not? Yeah. So the, the whole objective is to control the cow. So wherever you need to be on that cow, okay. whether it's a little bit higher, a little bit further ahead on that cow, every cow has a little different balance point. And when you, when they first let that cow in the arena and you turn it left and right a few times on that end wall before you go down the long wall, 
then um, then you're trying to figure out does this cow do, will this cow turn when I'm at its neck or do I need to be at, up by its nose in order oh, to turn okay. this cow? You kind of try to figure out what what type of cow do I have? Does this okay, cow okay. respect my horse or or is this cow just mad and just wants to run over my horse or like yeah. what type of cow have okay. they let in here? And so you try to kind of um, figure out um, what type of what type of cow they let in and then and then you then when you you do that on the short wall when you're not going as fast and then you turn the corner and send it down the long wall okay. and then you try to remember that okay i'm going because when everything gets amplified with speed right so yep. so if you're if you're overshooting that cow a little bit on the short wall going slow then and you do the exact same thing going down the long wall you're going to overshoot the cow by instead of overshooting it by three feet you'll overshoot it by 20 feet oh, and then okay. you'll be then you're out of position and as soon as you're out of position it usually just goes like usually you just end up kind of chasing that cow around and okay. like, you lose control like it, at, yeah. you have to maintain that control through the entire run because if at some point you lose control if you have a good enough horse and the right cow you can get it back um but you'll have lost points there right okay yeah um because you get scored on every part of the yeah every yeah. again every every part of that run so the left circles with the cow the right circles the turn um like the the turns down the fence all of that are all okay. scored based on the form and quality of the turns and the difficulty of the cow and okay uh, yeah so that you kind of answered my next question then i guess like do the do the cows ever get away like does that um, do you... you mean like out of the pen? no like do you not do it correctly and it oh kind for of, sure yeah yeah, yeah yeah way more often than i care to admit <laughs> okay, yeah, for yeah. sure <laughs> so and, and like when you get to the to the top competitions to for the most part are the horses able to to um control the cow and then it just comes down to points or yeah yeah there's it does and um and also like um even at the higher levels you'll see cows just get away from horses and just kind of not like them not have a controlled run even at the very highest okay. level um and and sometimes part of that is too because that's usually the last event of the of the show so, so they're tired so well not only not really okay. we're anymore now there's enough time they allow for enough time yeah. between the events and the horses have like we have salt water spas at the shows and like they they're getting the highest level of yeah. treatment um possible um so they're usually not that tired it's that um you know coming into that last event whether you need to mark a big score to still be oh, in the money okay. or whether you it, like maybe if you just put down an average run you'll be okay you'll be in the money so you may not take any chances yeah, but I if see. you need to mark a big score you'll if you're kind of risks. if you're yeah if yeah. you're kind of behind <laughs> you'll go down you'll turn the corner to go down that fence with a cat like for instance if you're they let the cow in and you know that you only need to mark like a 70 which would be that's like that's the every horse starts off i should have said that earlier every horse starts off in all of these events every horse starts off with a 70 that's so like, that's why there's the minus scores yeah yeah so okay. you either go down from 70 or up from 70 okay. and then and then if there's three judges then that's 70 times three so if you mark a 70 at the end of your run times three that's 210 yeah okay. and then if you have two judges it's 140 and, so and 210 so on. would be an average run. that would be an yeah. that would be like a, yeah just a, an average no degree of difficulty or maybe you had high degrees of difficulties in parts of the pattern but you got a penalty somewhere and so uh, you ended up back at 70 or, and stuff like that um so definitely um when you're going into that in the cow horse when you're going into that last event and you know that if you all you need to do is mark a 70 mm -hmm. and you'll be you'll you'll have a good score because your last two events were very strong maybe you've marked really well in the cutting and you were really good in the reining and now going down the fence all i need to do is play it safe you might turn that cow a few extra times on that end wall and and just get it a little more tired before mm, you run down the yeah. long wall so that you have a better chance of controlling it but if you're sitting if you're sitting way down in the standings already on that last day and you and they let that cow in there you're gonna you may only turn it once or twice and then run down the down the long wall with a very fresh cow that with it so is I that considered a higher level that's of a higher degree of difficulty okay, yeah. yeah yeah and uh so and so when that happens you're hoping they let in a wild cow that okay, really yeah. wants to run so that you can mark as high as possible okay i was i was that's interesting you say that because i was going to ask if you ever get a get a cow that's like 
super athletic and uh, <laughs> oh yeah yeah and but that's actually a good thing because you can score higher potentially. yeah if you're yeah. on a good horse now yeah. i've definitely been in there sometimes sitting on some less athletic horses where i'm just hoping they let out some sort of a hippopotamus <laughs> that i can just kind of plop down there <laughs> yeah but on the good if you if you're sitting on a really good fence horse yeah you hope that they let in some kind of an antelope that, that you can just that you can show the judges that i'm sitting on an athlete here yeah like yeah, it's yeah. interesting that that variable that uh, that the cow brings into it that like that that makes it a little unknown what's going to happen, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, and that that variable is what um that that variable is also what makes it so fun because um the cow doesn't care whether you're one of the big names in the industry or whether you're just little old me. Yeah. Um it might work. I might get a really good cow and mark a big score or um or, or and the next guy who's a much better trainer than me might uh, might get a just a really ignorant cow that uh, <laughs> doesn't respect his horse's space at all. And now they do the judges do watch for that if they if if early in the competition on that end wall already they see that a cow is not gonna give this guy at all a chance. Oh, um, okay. Like if the cow is just being really belligerent then uh they'll whistle that cow out and they'll let oh, in, okay, let in a new one yeah, yeah if okay. it's if it's clearly that they if they if the judges feel that uh, that this cow will not allow this horse to show any of its ability then they will ask for a new one okay yeah yeah um so I, i've been curious about this because i mean I, you think about this and other types of um horse competitions besides what what you're talking about um, which is more important, the the rider or the horse in <laughs> um, competing? That's a good question. I uh, well, definitely, I would say it's it really depends on the rider, and it um, in some classes, like some of the lower um, classes, like the amateur classes and so on. Um, well, even that, I don't know that I could say that it's, it's probably, it's 50, 50, I would say okay. like, it's not uh, big be, because, um, you can be the best trainer in the world. And if you're not sitting on, a you know, an athlete, yeah. um, you're not going to win anything well, in, obviously, in today's competition. But a bad rider wouldn't do well with a good horse either, right? No, 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 that definitely like that, that happens as well. But then. But then those are usually in lower, in lower oh, um, levels yeah, as yeah. well. So that happens a lot, where you have you know lower level riders, and they'll have a they'll have a really good horse that kind of helps them out in some of those situations. Oh, so yeah. so I don't. What's more important? I don't know. Probably like are there? So you take the best riders, and you would say you would mix up their horses, just randomly assign them to yeah. a horse. Um, or maybe like how much does knowing your horse come into it too? Like, is that really important or could any, any professional rider jump on a well-trained horse and they'd be good to go? No, any pro, any good rider can, can jump on a well-trained okay. horse within yeah. that discipline and yeah. generally make it look pretty respectable. Okay. Um, yeah. they might not, they might not mark as high as a rider that knows the horse really well, Okay. but, uh, but no, they'll be able to to make it look good okay like, yeah. so if there let's say you would do that where you'd randomly assign uh, the best horses to the best riders would there be like a couple riders that would that you could predict would would take the top spot consistently or probably okay yes. so there yeah. are there are no there are ri riders. oh for yeah. sure no yeah. that's a huge no definitely and, and the training probably comes into it too like how well they're training those horses yeah and... yeah no training is huge and there's definitely like within the industries there's your top dogs so to speak yeah. that will uh that that win more than anyone else and 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 you know then the argument what came first the chicken or the egg yeah. sort of deal right <laughs> the argument comes like you know would they be there if it wasn't for these such, such and such great horses well mm -hmm. maybe not but maybe they wouldn't have ever gotten the opportunity to ride those horses had they not already had some talent and stuff yeah. like that right yeah. so so it's <laughs> uh, it's hard to know what uh what's uh what's more important i i don't know what's more important actually the the rider or the horse i've never really thought about that before but i would say it's it's very much a 
it's very much a 50 50 partnership mm-hmm. and and in the cow horse well in in reining it's it's you and that horse versus the pattern um like you're trying to execute this pattern like you're a team and you're trying to execute this pattern to the to the best of your so you're a you're a team you're working yeah. together 50 50 and then in the cow horse like especially coming into that fence work finals i think of it as like going to war almost it's like oh, okay. me and the horse against the cow so like yeah. we're trying to we're trying to um to control that cow um and and it's very much a feeling like that if you feel pretty alone out there in that arena especially at like a big show in the finals or something like that okay, yeah. and you're you're out there in the in the arena and there's all these people that you don't know watching and and it's nice to feel that you um yeah it, it's nice to have that comfort of knowing that like um me and my horse are a partner like yeah. we got this you know it's a good feeling <laughs> yeah it's really neat um what's your favorite of the competitions that you do or type of competition i I don't know. I like all three of okay, them. Yeah, I, I like any, I like, I like doing whatever my horse is good at. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if I, if I'm sitting on a really good reining horse, I like to do the reining. If I'm sitting on a good cow horse, I, I like the cow horse. So yeah. It, it, yeah, it just, it just depends on the, on the horse. I, I really enjoy, um, trying to bring out the best in a horse. It's not really about just the competition for me. I, I love, um, just trying to bring out the that horse's strengths whatever Mm. whatever that is and maybe for that horse it's just uh to be a quiet easy easy going horse for anybody to ride but it's it's fun to try and find the strengths in those horses oh yeah that's kind of where it all started for me and that's kind of still what it's about i guess yeah it's 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 sometimes it's it you can get a little lost in the whole competition world but at the end of the day it's still it's still just about um about bringing out the strengths of your horse yeah well now that you've said that um as far as competition goes what's the best result that you've that you've ever had or what's uh what's the most successful that you've been in a competition um probably last fall um i made the uh what the in the cow horse competition i made the um the finals at the snaffle bit futurity it's like a it's like the world championship of of um cow horse okay. three-year-old competition mm-hmm. and uh yeah we made the finals there i had a i had still have the horse it's a a really really nice horse that i i just love him he's he's so fun on a cow and and uh, i didn't even i don't feel like i even did him justice he was probably okay. had he been with a better rider he would have probably um done even better but uh but yeah he we managed to make the, the uh, that was our first major event finals and okay in the cow horse and uh so that was a pretty pretty cool feeling so is that going against the the best three-year-olds in the world or not yeah 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 okay nice. yeah so uh how many are in the finals how many make the finals? uh in the finals i'm not even that's a good question i i think there's maybe i think there might be there's different divisions so i think there's 25 in the open um i think in the limited open finals i think there was a there was 15 of us that made the okay. finals. So and are there like rounds? That, yeah. That so there's a, there's, or? yeah, there's okay. a, there's a one go around uh, in, of all the events. And then your high, then the highest scores um, from the first go around make go on to the finals. And oh, okay. I think it's, they started out with like in, in the total futurity, there was, there was close to 400 horses. Oh, wow. In it. Okay. Yeah. Like maybe 380 or something like that, that there, there was in. And so uh, you were like top 15 out of, like out of the, that division. So there was, oh, okay. Gotcha. So there was, yeah. Like I think in the level one, um, we, we ended up second in the level one tied for second with a, another trainer from Pennsylvania, um, that, um, I should Alex, uh, I can't remember, remember her full name. Now I got a mind block, but I should, I should, um, I should just mention her name because, uh, it, it was, it was kind of cool that there was two of us from the East coast that, uh, generally in the cow horse is more of a West coast okay. tradition. So yeah. it was kind of cool that two of us from the East coast yeah. managed to do so well there. Um, but yeah, we ended up second and I think there was a hundred horses in that division. So, so that we were second okay. out of, out of a hundred in nice. that, in that division. And then, in the level two, I don't remember remember how many horses were in that total there might have been another hundred or something like that okay um yeah. and then there's the, the uh, level three and four would be the the top level um 
in that and uh i didn't make the finals in those those two divisions oh, okay. but yeah. uh but uh yeah to make the uh, major event finals that's probably at at this point in my career that's probably the highlight as yeah. far as competition goes oh that's great um I was this is changing the subject a little bit now here, but uh, I was looking over your Facebook feed, and um, I was noticing that uh, you um, were featured in a in a couple of um, I think a few different ones, maybe some a saddle or something like that, and um, and a, a truck ad. Um, oh yeah. So I was uh, I was noticing that, and um, yeah, I was just just curious how you how that came to be or how uh, how. Um, yeah, what uh, what led to to being part of those ads? Um, just having a face for TV is kind of a big <laughs> part of it. No, <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, they definitely they they tried to make sure. If you notice, most of the shots I'm pretty far away. So <laughs> so <laughs> so that's how I got in there. No, um, um, it's kind of funny actually. The the Dodge or the Ram commercial. Yeah. Um, that one. That one actually, and I don't like telling people this because uh, then uh, then they'll um, they'll uh, yeah they'll, they'll change how they think about me maybe. But um, actually, so the first I got a phone call um, about two years ago I think was when when we uh, shot that okay. commercial. Um, I, I think I got a phone call from um, Los Angeles from a film crew, and they just. Uh, they asked if I drive Ram trucks and I was like, yeah, I, I guess I, I do. And, uh, and they were like, um, okay, would you be interested in being in an, in an ad? And I was like, sure, I, I guess I, I, I'll do that. No problem. And, uh, and then they, then, uh, they were like, okay, well, we'll call you back with some details. And, um, so about a, a few days later, maybe two or three days later, they called me back and were like, um, so actually, uh, they were like, so you're on Martin Ranch, right? And I was like, yeah. And uh, they're like, okay, um, so where are you located? And I said, uh, on Ontario, Canada. And, and they're like, oh, Canada. Um, they're like, okay. So so they had been kind of whatever you call it, commissioned or whatever by Ram to shoot some a bunch oh, of commercials. So this for, wasn't this wasn't Ram. This wasn't themselves. Ram. So this this was like the a, film a crew, company, like a third party. Yeah. 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 So they were they were doing doing these commercials for Ram and then um and then they actually and Ram had given them some names of some people that they can get a hold of that they've done commercials with before. Okay. And there's a Martin Ranch in Colorado apparently. That's so, just... <laughs> so I was I was on YouTube like uh, I think my, the link that I clicked on took me to YouTube and then the next recommended video was also Martin Ranch. I'm like, "Oh, I must have done two um, two of these commercials." <laughs> and then I saw that there was another Martin Ranch in Colorado like doing a Ram commercial as well. Yeah, yeah. so unbeknownst to me or them, I guess, the um Ram there's another Martin Ranch in Colorado. And, um, and they're an actual, like a big ranch, like uh, not, not a small 50 acre <laughs> horse training facility. It's you know, a, a real ranch. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's the real deal. So, uh, they, and they have lots of trucks and lots of brand new trucks and stuff like that. And so, uh, so, um, but by that point they had kind of researched us a little bit and were interested in our story and wanted to kind of oh, tell okay. our story or whatever. So, yep. uh. So they were like, well, we'll we're going to talk to Ram anyways and see whether we can get permission to to feature you in a commercial. And so I was like, okay, that's cool. And so, yeah, about a week later, they called back and said, yeah, they got the go ahead from Ram to go ahead and um, and shoot this uh, commercial. And okay. so they did a they did a, a great job. There's way more. They like I'm sure they have enough footage for a whole TV show probably. So it <laughs> was it a few days? Or? It was a week of Are you filming. Serious? Yeah, like a, every day, like all day. Yeah, or yeah, most of the day. Yeah, yep. yeah, like it was. Uh, yeah, they like we would start. Yeah, like not a not a full day, but they would start by eight in the morning, and and most of the time we were filming like till three or okay whatever. Well. Yeah, no, it was a it was. And had they kind of given you suggestions of what they were looking for? Or? Yeah, yeah, they had an idea. They had several different storylines. Like the original, the the final cut was way different than the one they actually started out okay. with. Okay. Yep. Um, there's so many different directions they could have gone with the. Mm -hmm 
with the uh, kind of story because they were featuring. It wasn't a TV commercial; it was an internet commercial. Okay. Um. So it's longer and more in more of a story right. form. So I guess in a TV ad, it's like thirty seconds, right? Yeah. And it's and it's much more. There's much more to it. Like there's a, a way. It's a bigger production, so they'll have, um, they'll have their whole the production set that comes on and and it and you have to do makeup and because everything's very high definition and close up and oh, it, it's I so see, yeah. it's a lot different than uh than doing an internet commercial okay. so the internet commercial is a little more low-key they still have high quality cameras and they have they had a crew of three which was they said was a very much a skeleton crew okay for what they were used to doing um yeah. but they and that's also partly why it took so long to get all the shots and stuff oh but, i see uh, yeah but uh yeah so they so so it was a it was yeah it was it was kind of interesting they were awesome it was really fun to get to know them because they're like such a different world the los angeles film uh um world is is a lot different than uh than a cowboy chasing (laughs) cattle or whatever it's a little different world that um but it but it was cool um it was it was fun to fun to do it and uh I, I was getting a little by the end it was like every if I did something once I had to do it ten times. Like, oh, like I, see, I would yeah. do something one time and they'd be like, Okay, do that again but uh, with a far away look in your eyes or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. But they were super understanding too, like especially some of the shoots with the or some of the shots. Sorry, with the with the horses and stuff. Like they would they would always ask me, "Is it is the horse okay to do it one more time?" Or oh, stuff okay. like it's, that. Like yeah. they were very very understanding and and great people like to work with. It was yeah. so fun. Like one of them was from Australia, another one was from South Africa, and one was from like Mississippi or something. Oh and wow! So just to hear their they we went out for supper the one night and just to hear their stories and stuff. It was it was pretty neat. Yeah. Um, and so that was the, yeah, I guess that's the main commercial that I've been in. And then, uh, then the other one was for a, a sponsor actually. Okay. Um, yep. The, the Jim Taylor saddle, um, um, is a sponsor of, of mine. And so, uh, so they just shot that one. That one was pretty recent. We just shot that one, uh, this summer. Oh, okay. And, um, nice. and that one was much easier to shoot because it was a much smaller, uh, like um smaller scale okay. production crew that did it and uh, and they did a great job of it and but it was like we shot that all in w- in one shoot like so oh wow. that whole like commercial was yeah, yeah oh it was like three hours oh, probably okay. it was yeah. all done so so that was so yeah when they told me uh, originally when they're like yeah we like to do a commercial i was like kind of bracing myself i'm like oh boy here we go again um sort of thing but uh but they yeah it was it was very um not that I minded the the Dodge one. It was it was really or the Ram. Sorry, it's yeah. not Dodge anymore. They've changed to oh there's, okay. There's Dodge and there's Ram and there's kind of two separate companies oh, within the company. I guess so. I have to be careful what I say there. But um, but yeah, just uh, um, not that it, it was fun to do and everything. But I was like, oh, I don't know if I have a week to of my time to yeah. <laughs> to donate in the middle of show season. Then, but then uh, uh, talking to the um to the owner of the business there he was like no no we'll we'll keep it uh we'll just do it some evening oh yeah um and uh so yeah it's it's, it was kind of interesting and there's lots of i'm sure there's lots of your audience that would have much more um much more knowledge on on the way some of that stuff works but what's really what made it so tricky was when i would look at a video I only watched what, how what that horse was doing, how and and how that horse was doing it, and okay. whether it was okay, like whether I liked the like the form that horse was having yeah. and all of that in that maneuver. And they would be looking at things like lighting and focus yeah. of the camera and all of that, and 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 I never like i i didn't even notice that stuff yeah, it looked exactly, a lot better yeah. than my cell phone videos <laughs> yeah. so so i thought it was always great but uh yeah. but i would be looking at what that horse was doing and and to them it kind of they all looked pretty similar so uh, yeah so it, so that was a that was a, a challenge to try and um but they did really good about letting me um always letting me like look at them f- at the clips first and say whether i want that in an ad or not oh okay thing. well it's so, nice to have so, that that to mm-hmm. say yeah. yeah it's great um we just have a couple minutes left here yet so um i thought i'd give you a chance to um give any advice that you have for um horse owners um or people that are interested in in getting into training um or do better with their training do you have any um short advice to 
to hand out here yet? I would say like if you're just a, a horse owner, if you're not looking to make a living at it, um, but any type, any level of horse owner, whether you're interested in competition or not, I would really recommend definitely trying to find, get some, get some sort of input in your training, whether mm. like find a, find a coach or find a, um, a mentor of some kind, um, and, and use different ones. Like, like, you know, maybe for certain parts of your training, you're better off with, uh, with a different type of coach than, uh, than you are for other parts of your, yeah. like you can always learn and expand your knowledge and, and, and definitely the, like the, with all of the, uh, we have some great local horsemen and women in Ontario that are very good at what they do. Mm -hmm. And I would just recommend like, um, trying to, uh, trying to learn, use those, use those avenues. There's so many, um, great local trainers around that you can learn from. And, and I would just definitely say that, uh, try and, try and, um, try and expand your yeah. knowledge with the way, because as much as virtual stuff, um, is great and it's a, and I use it as well. Mm -hmm. Um, nothing replaces that, that, uh, face to face interaction, yeah. like with a coach or whatever. If, and if, so if you can, if you can get a chance to do that or, or attend a clinic or, uh, or something like that, I think that's a, that's a great, um, a great way to, to, um, just even, um, be around other people that are also oh, trying yeah. to learn and, and, uh, and, you know the enthusiasm is yeah. infectious right so yeah B building community even with uh with others yeah you get yeah. to meet so many people yeah. that's the great thing about the horse industry i've met been able to the horse industry has allowed me and my wife to meet so many like mm -hmm. people so many s super interesting individuals from all over like it's allowed us to meet people from all over the world yeah and uh yeah. and so just to yeah meet all those different people and hear their stories and their experiences and the, within the horse world is, is, is a lot of fun. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much for, um, for coming on and sharing. It's always, I always enjoy like kind of talking with someone that, that I know so little about um, what they do and, and it's just, yeah, I feel like I've learned so much here in the, in the last couple hours. Um, just before we, we do sign off, I want to give you a chance to say anything yet that you, um, that you wanted to say that you didn't have a chance or if you have um, something since you you came on here I'd uh, like to give you a chance to um, to promote something if you want to do that so is there anything you wanted to say yet before um, before we wrap it up um, I I guess I just want to thank um, all of my team there at Martin Ranch that is a that takes an entire team and my family um, is a huge part of that um, like to allow me the the freedom to go globe trotting so to speak yeah. with my horses and uh and compete it takes it, it's a lot of, there's a lot of sacrifice involved in that as well and and um and i wouldn't be able to do it without the great team that we have there and without the support from my family so i just like to really um thank my wife and uh and my kids they're young enough that they don't uh really understand the whole thing yet but yeah. uh <laughs> but definitely without that support it would be impossible to um to do what what we do and uh so i just like to yeah i just like to really thank them and uh and for giving me the opportunity to chase this passion that uh that we have i guess yeah well that's great and yeah thanks again for uh for coming on and uh and sharing i've uh i've really enjoyed it no thank you it's been uh it's been a lot of fun and uh i enjoy listening to every one of your podcast i don't think i've missed one yet i guess the one that came out today i uh, i haven't heard yet but i'll oh, probably yeah. listen to that on the way home <laughs> all right sounds good thanks again thank you everyone for listening and thank you chet for sharing your knowledge with us it was a lot of fun to hear about what goes into training the different types of horses whether it be an athletic competition horse a ranch horse or a backyard horse i really liked hearing about his goal of bringing the best out of whatever horse he is training and to think about what is best for the horse and in its training what a horse needs on any particular day. I also liked hearing about the different types of competition and I think it'd be a lot of fun to uh, go and observe some of those competitions sometime. So thank you Chad for sharing those things with us. As always, it'd be great to have you connect with the show. You can share 
uh, what you've enjoyed from a particular episode or um, ask me a question anytime. So send me an email at contact at everydayexpertise.ca. If you want more information about the show or want links or notes that go with this particular episode, then check out the website everydayexpertise.ca. That's all for now. Join me again next week to learn from the expertise of everyday people. 